Let's bring in Democratic Congressman Denny Heck of Washington. He and his colleagues interviewed Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson, Glenn Simpson rather, behind closed doors this week as part of its Russia investigation. Uh, Congressman, always good to see you. Let's get right to it because I want your reaction to these developments. Is Jared Kushner not being forthcoming with congressional investigators, or might you be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that failing to disclose meetings or overtures by Russians was not specific to congressional requests? So, Alex, happy Thanksgiving, by the way. It, it's Thank been you. another week of revelations, and the Jared Kushner issue is one. Uh, I think at least as significantly was the fact that Donald Trump Jr. was engaged in direct email exchanges with WikiLeaks. Uh, we learned also this week that Director Mueller is now calling in Hope Hicks of the Trump administration, as well as requesting additional documents. And, oh, by the way, this in the same week in which the president has indicated that he believes Vladimir Putin over the intelligence com uh, community in our country. Look, this thing is moving, and it's moving very fast, and it's not moving in a good direction Look, for the president. I, I'm curious, Donald Trump Jr. and the WikiLeaks revelation, were you surprised by that? How significant is that? So I think probably the thing that's most appropriate that I could say is at this stage, nothing surprises me. Hmm. Okay. Um, I want to play for you what Luke Harding, uh, as you know, he's a journalist who interviewed Christopher Steele before the Trump dossier became public. What he said to me about Glenn Simpson and Russia having compromising information on President Trump. Here it is. I think Glenn is also quietly confident that the dossier is right. I mean, he's taken a lot of flack and, and fire for, for how it came about and all the rest of it. And I think in a way that's missing the point. It's not about process. It's not about who paid for the dossier. It, the, the question is, did Donald Trump and his team collude with Russia? Uh, and I think the more we know, the more certain we can be to say, to say yes, actually they did. A lot of secret meetings is the title of my book. Um, and, and each week we learn, we learn of more interactions. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is what the KGB does. That they try and penetrate, they try and target, they try and cultivate for their own purposes. Look, I know you can't tell us exactly what was said, but did you leave your meeting with Glenn Simpson believing more significantly that Russia has compromising information on President Trump? Uh, Alex, I left that meeting thinking I had just spent the most unbelievable, I don't know how many hours we were in there together. It was many that I had thus far in this year. Look, I'm going to take you back to something I said, I think, on your program in the spring that was a little controversial at the time, but I'm going to reiterate it today. People are going to jail. People are going to go to jail. Uh, and in fact, when I said that, I came in for some criticism for it. But now, of course, we've seen several indictments. I'm also going to go on record here today and say additional people are going to be indicted. I've also said, and we'll reiterate here today, that where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's so much smoke, you can't see the hand in front of your face. Hmm. Jeff Sessions, I know, returned before your committee um, at the end of, a, of the month for a closed-door interview. What did you learn from the public grilling that he faced before the House Judiciary Committee? So um, the thing I would say about Attorney General Sessions, two things. First of all, he is suffering some from a, with some of the most profoundly selective amnesia of any human being I've ever met in my life. He seems just never to quite remember the things that might incriminate him. The other thing that I would say about him is that he's clearly on the watch, fi the firing watch list, right? It's in Washington, D.C., there's kind of like this inside game of, Who's going to get fired first, Rex Tillerson or Jeff Simpson or Jeff Sessions? But I find it all, frankly, kind of ironic. <laughs> On another newsworthy note of this week, Alex, Rich Cordray announced his retirement from the Consumer for, mm -hmm. uh, Finance Protection Bureau. Originally, President Obama wanted to appoint Elizabeth Warren to that, but Republicans wouldn't allow that. So she went on to be a United States senator. Now they've hounded Rich Cordray out of office, and can you say Governor Rich Cordray in the state of Ohio? Hmm. And at the same time, Mr. Sessions, who left his seat in Alabama in order to become attorney general, can you now say United States Senator Doug Jones, the Democrat, who is up by eight points? in the most recent poll by Brand X News Network, which often doesn't reveal information favorable to Democrats. So this thing is full of ironies as it relates to all of it. I want to get on to the uh, allegations of sexual misconduct against Senator Al Franken. I want to play for you what Congressman John Yarmouth told me this morning about Franken's future in the Senate. Here's that. I don't think you ought to resign unless President Trump resigns. That was it.
I mean, very concisely, boom, that was the question. What do you make of that response, and where do you stand on Senator Franken's political future, given these allegations? So I think that uh, Senator Franken himself has called for a Senate ethics investigation. Uh, I think that's the appropriate next step to take in that uh, process. And I think my dear friend John Yarmuth, who's one of the most outstanding members of the United States House of Representatives, was being his usual pithy and to the point right on mm -hmm. in his comment. Yeah, I'm used to that, having interviewed him a number of times. Before I let you go, uh, let's talk tax reform. And I want to play this exchange between Senate Finance Chair Orrin Hatch and Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown. Here it goes. I really resent anybody saying that I'm just doing this for the rich. Give me a break. I think you guys overplay that all the time and it gets old. And oh, frankly, you ought, to, sure. you ought to quit it. With all due respect, I get sick and tired of the richest people Regular order, country, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Getting richer Regular and richer. Regular order. When you hear that at this point, what is the best to hope for out of this tax bill for you? And do you dread that it passes or are there some positives you can see? Well, it did in fact pass the House of Representatives on Thursday mm -hmm. and it was a very sad day as a matter of fact. Alex, if there was ever a Robin Hood in reverse piece of legislation, this is it. So memo to Senator Hatch, I'm sorry, sir, the facts are the facts. 50% of the tax benefits of this bill go to the top 1% of income earners in America. So that cannot be argued. Those are the facts by independent evaluations of this legislation. And, and, and it is... Go ahead. No, but when you see those numbers, and there are so many reports that refute the numbers that are put out there in support of this, uh, this bill passing, is there just political pressure? You read it everywhere that there's so much political pressure for Republicans to get something passed that this has to go through. They're going to push it through no matter what. Well, they're going to try and push it through no matter what, and it, in fact, may pass. But actually, I think there are some little glimmers of optimism there over the week with respect to some of the other senators' reaction to this. Uh, Senator Johnson from Wisconsin came out against it if there weren't some changes made uh, to benefit small businesses, which are not particularly well favored in this legislation. Senator Collins has her issues with the individual mandate. And of course, again, Alex, after December 12th, if they don't get to it before then, then they'll be down one more when Senator Doug Jones is sworn in from the state of Alabama. Look, this Paul Ryan deficit exploding tax plan uh, frankly pulls back the curtain on the hypocrisy of Republicans who for years have claimed to care about deficits. Clearly they don't. They're adding $1.5 trillion with a T to the, uh, to the federal deficit, to the federal de debt. So look, um, they do this by closing very few tax preferences that mostly affect low and middle income families. They take away medical deductibility for expenses beyond 10% of gross income. And when grandma goes into the nursing home and is spending down, she's not going to be able to deduct it. They take away the ability to deduct student loan interest repayment. They take away the ability of a teacher who is paying for classroom uh, items, pencils, paper, mm -hmm. out of their pocket. They take away the ability for them to deduct that up to $250. They, they, they have this kind of veneer of closing tax preferences, but they tend to affect just disproportionately low-income and middle-income people, while 50% of the benefits are going to the top 1% of income earners. Well, what do you think the chances are that this gets to the president desk, president's desk for him to sign by Christmas? Oh, in its current form, Slim and none, and Slim just left the room. Uh, in some form, there's a better chance than that, to be sure. Whether or not they can get there, I think, frankly, just remains to be seen and is in no small part going to be dependent upon whether America will stand up and speak out as they did against repeal of the Affordable Health Care. We're just beginning to see some of that, and if it continues, if during this Thanksgiving week they come home and they meet some voters who say, you know, we don't think that 50 percent of the benefits ought to go to the top 1 percent of income earners, and we don't think you ought to take away the deduction of medical expenses above 10 percent of gross income, if they hear enough of those voices, then I think that there's a good chance that this bill will be materially changed. And at the end of the day, Alex, there's a case to be made for tax reform. 
This bill is no longer tax reform. It is simply Paul Ryan's deficit exploding tax plan. It's a tax cut to benefit mostly the wealthy. Mm -hmm. I could make a good case for tax reform that simplifies the system, uh, frankly, that makes it easier for people to be able to file, that encourages economic growth and that is more transparent. Mm -hmm. I can make a case for that. That's not what this bill does. All right, Congressman Denny Heck, always good to speak with you. I appreciate your insights you. very much. The Alabama women